Management by Results. The term management by results was developed by Peter F. Drucker, who was a leading writer on management theory in the 20th and 21st century. Let's learn a little more about this from Dr. Bachman. Well, hello, Ramon. Today we're going to talk about management by results. I went up into the attic and I got a bunch of supplies. This is an example of management by results. You have someone up on top who is the leader of the organization. Around this person are other leaders that report to them. As you go down, there are other layers of people that report to the layer above, each one reporting to the ones above. The person up here is quite a long distance from the people down here. In management by results, the idea is the people up here set the objectives. They set the objectives for the next layer down. These people then make objectives for the people down here, and they then make the objectives for the people who are on the front line. As you look at this, it makes a little bit of sense. You give people goals and objectives, and then you give them the freedom to be able to do that. There's some also nice advantages of this system. Uh, you can delegate resources. Uh, down various paths. So that's kind of a good thing. There's a lot of meeting time where you can get people together and kind of talk about things. So that's an advantage. As you look at some of the disadvantages of it, one of the things you have to understand is control is very, very important. It's very important that you have control over your system. One of the things that, that happens in this type of system by management by results is implementation is a sign of success. If I can get a project and I can make it successful, I will please the people above them. Think about things like electronic medical records. If I can just get that thing implemented, I can demonstrate to people, hey, I've accomplished something. I can then move up to the next level. Another thing that goes on with this is that uh, if you want to be happy here, you have to please the people of, up above you. Consequently, you're always going up to the next level to get permission to proceed. You always have to make sure that you're in step with the people up here. So there's a lot of permission seeking. That slows the system down. One of the things that's going on is that compliance is really what you get out of the people down here. You don't get commitment. You get compliance. We'll do what you tell us. The people down here on the lowest level oftentimes will see repeated things going on over and over again. We'll try one thing. We'll do it for a couple of years. Then what will happen is they find out it doesn't work. They'll try another thing. And then they'll go back to it and back and forth. And many of the people who are on the, the working front will see, oh my gosh, we did this 10 years ago. It didn't work. Why are they doing it again? And as you look at that, you say that if you take a look, oftentimes what will happen is they will do things called reorganizations. They'll take an area and just reorganize it. The success rate for a reorganization is one in four. Anytime you reorganize, you're talking about someone who will have a success rate of only one in four. Another thing that happens with management by results is you tend to get silos going down. Uh, sometimes they're so thick they're not called silos, they're called chimneys. Uh, it's so thick and what happens is you stay in your silo. For example, nursing might have more uh, uh, in relationship with the up and down structure than across. Or physicians might have a silo. Or administrators or financial people. The thing is they all develop their own silos. There tends to be a, a lot of short term thinking. Let's just get the results done for today. The biggest problem with management by results is, here you are, you're on this level, you've been given a project, you know you need to please the person above you, and you can't quite make it. What do you do? What you do if you're normal is you'll fudge the figures. You'll make it so that it'll appear that you're successful, so that you can go up to the next level. Fudging in numbers is very, very common. Or you'll just alter things so it looks like you're better than you actually are. Fudging is a lot of, uh, of what goes on when you bring back information back and forth. There's also down here fear. 
What happens if I don't make those numbers? Will they take me and move me down? So fear goes on here. Or gee whiz, maybe I won't get that appraisal that I need. If I step outside of the box and start doing things way down here on the line, people won't like that. I'll get a poor appraisal. And what will happen then is I won't do so well. Interestingly enough, if you take a look at this system, who suffers the most? The customers. The customers are, are left out. It's better to please the people above you than the customers. Also, the people down here working, um, they also have some troubles. They've done some studies uh, at the American Hospital Association. I'm going to get these figures out here so I'll know exactly what it is. A fellow by the name of Steve Matville looked at the knowledge of what's going on down here in the work processes. Well, obviously, in the front line, they know 100%. Supervisors only know 74% of what's really going on with their processes. Middle management, 9%. Top management, 4%. So there's a real disconnect between the top and the bottom as to what's going on in a day-to-day -day routine. Sometimes what will happen is the top person will come down here and talk with the troops. One of the things that goes on in here is there's not, not a lot of common things going on between these two. This person only has 4% of the knowledge. He, he, he's probably pretty clueless as to what's really going on. In this system, one of the things that's really important is you have to do things right. If you don't do things right, then uh, you'll be moved down. Also, it's important everybody stays really busy. Uh, we all want everybody working all the time. On the day this system falls apart and the company falls apart, there's two things I can assure you. One, there'll be people saying, gee, we did things right, and everybody was working really hard. The problem is, how do you get people in here to do the right thing? How do you get people to do the right thing? So that's management by results. Uh, it's a system that I think many of you uh, are familiar with. One of the things I think is that uh, we're showing this in its best possible light. Obviously, if you're in this morass, there might be politics going on. And if there's politics going on, or if there's competition going on in here, you're going to have more and more difficulties. We talked about that in one of our previous talks. Suppose you're a, a company here, or a section of this uh, company, and you need to lose money for the rest of the system to go on. Will your system allow you to do that? Or do you say, gee, I don't want to lose money because if I do that, I might have to go down. It's hard to see the whole system when you're in your silo or chimney. So that's management by results. Well, interesting enough, Peter Drucker and Edwards Deming they actually lived next to each other in the 1950s. They must have had some interesting conversations over beer. Can't you kind of imagine these two great thinkers sitting down there and talking to each other? At the end of it, Drucker um, conceded that uh, his system was actually pretty decent, except for one problem. And that was people had to know what the objectives were. And 90% of the time, people just didn't know what the right objectives were. Deming always said afterwards that Finally, Drucker capitulated that this system would not work in a real uh, company as well as the system that Deming proposed. Well, well, we'll learn more about Deming's system in our next chapter, but that is management by results. And so management by results has its advantages. Resources are delegated. There's plenty of time for meetings. There's a way to set up goals and evaluate progress toward those goals. But for this method to work, people need to know what the actual aim of the system is. And unfortunately, this isn't always the case. And really, this leads to a lot of the disadvantages that are inherent in managing by results. And Dr. Bachman touched on a number of these disadvantages. The fact that implementation is a sign of success, not outcomes. The feeling that you have to please the level above you. The fact that you need permission to make decisions. The presence of compliance, not commitment. The development of silos. The development of short-term, not long-term thinking. Fudging figures, fear and distortion of results, 
the fact that customers are left out of the equation and the disconnection between top management and the frontline workers. Dr. Bachman talked about a Harris Interactive poll which showed the disconnection between the goals of an organization and its frontline workers. The results documented a very low percentage of clarity, enthusiasm, leadership, freedom, and trust. In fact, if a soccer team represented the average organization, four out of eleven players would know which goal was theirs. Two out of eleven would care about their goal, would know what position they play, and would know what they were supposed to do. And all but two players would be competing against their own team members rather than their opponents. I can think of many healthcare related examples of management by results. I want you to discuss the theory of management by results and give examples of how this applies to your organization. How does doing things the right way and working hard in your current position interfere with doing the right thing?